for joining us at our Friday afternoon Facebook Live. It's uh, later than usual. We've had um, quite an eventful day, and uh, so we're late. I'm sorry about that. We'll try to be more on time in the future. But I'm glad you joined me, and uh, I wanted to chat with you briefly about postpartum depression. Uh, I, I've touched on that before, but it's Mother's Day coming up this Sunday. Every one of you had a mother or has a mother. Acknowledge that, honor it. Your mother may not have been the mother you would have designed. You probably weren't the child that she designed either. But I hope you really did acknowledge and appreciate one another and um, get the most from the relationship that you could and give the most to it that you were able. Mothers are amazing and I, this is the time to honor them and acknowledge what they do 24-7, 365. It's really, um, it should be more than one day really, but make sure you, you take it to heart and are responsive at least on this day. Um, mothers get to be mothers by being pregnant. Yeah, I think this is an adult enough crowd to talk about that. And um, it's a pretty scary time for a lot of people, uh, especially a first pregnancy. Uh, it's sort of the, um, the watershed moment from girl to woman or not quite having tested all the equipment to really putting all the equipment through its paces in a way that can be really, really alarming. Some people get blue. Blue is normal. Some people get depressed. Some people really need help getting through the pregnancy. And, and I mean help, I mean pharmaceutical help, pharmacologic help. And some people need it postpartum. Everyone gets blue after they deliver a little bit. Some a fair amount, and that's within normal limits. If it's lasting more than a month, if it's interfering with your bonding with your baby, if your relationships in the home are deteriorating and you just really can't see moving forward, it's time to seek an intervention. And Ketamine infusions for depression provide a really important intervention. Ketamine is a safer drug than the alternatives. It works much more quickly, and it produces a happier result in general. The other drugs tend to produce weight gain. That's not something that people who have just delivered welcome. It tends to produce loss of libido. People who have just delivered have enough issues with loss of libido. Consider ketamine. Consider it for yourselves, consider it for your wives, your daughters, who are having difficulty getting past the postpartum blues. If it's really postpartum depression and not just the blues, they should consider ketamine infusions. Now, Dr. Mendel, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is, um, okay, so it doesn't have uh, some of these uh, less desired side effects, but what about breastfeeding? And am I going to be passing anything on to my baby that would be causing it any type of harm? Uh, you know, is it going to be, though I personally wouldn't have this question, but I'm sure some people could wonder, am I, is my baby going to be a ketamine addict? And is it going to be dependent on ketamine if I have it and I breastfeed? Are there side effects that are going to be passed on? And some of these, you know, concerns, can you speak to some of them? The real answer to that is that we do not know. The information that you're looking for isn't known in humans. In other animals and in mammals, yes, ketamine does appear in the breast milk. No, it does not seem to cause any harm. No, it does not produce any kind of craving or addiction or drug-seeking behavior in laboratory animals. Nobody's done this with people. I would contrast the concerns with going on with the known adverse consequences of a woman who is really the center of a small universe for her child or children 
and her spouse, maybe her own parents as well, or maybe his parents as well, for that nucleus to be really not able to participate. There are horrendous consequences to that. So it's not like you're going to take this medicine and it might hurt somebody, or you're going to do nothing and everybody's going to be fine. Everyone isn't going to be fine. Something needs to be done. Right, and it, it, you know some of the alternative options have been proven to do some harm, right? Well, the other medications used for depression are shown to cause problems with the unborn child when given during pregnancy. Ketamine has not been shown to cause problems. It just hasn't been proven not to. Would that be fair to, or an accurate way to say that? There have been no problems with the unborn children of animals provided with ketamine during their pregnancy. There have been some problems with the animals who have, were provided with SSRIs, SNRIs, atypicals, and antipsychotics during their pregnancies. So I think that's a really important distinction, and I really appreciate you clarifying that, because I think there's a little bit of nuance to understanding what that means. And, you know, I think the wrong person could easily say, oh, well, no one knows about ketamine, and it could sound ominous. I think the way that you said it, it makes a little bit more sense. Would you agree with uh, that, and do you think that ketamine should be one of the first, if not the first, uh, things that a woman should look to if she is suffering from true postpartum depression? Well, I definitely think ketamine should be at the top of the list. The other agents are actually rated as category D substances for pregnancy. That means they're known to cause fetal harm. Ketamine is rated as a category C. The, the categories go from A, B, C, D, X. And A is no problem, B is no known problem, C is, I'm sorry, B is no problem after actual testing. C is no known problem after many observations but no definitive testing. D is definite problem. You don't want a D or an X medication if you can avoid it. If the mother is going to die or is in great jeopardy of harm, it's my opinion that she should take that drug even if it might produce harm in the fetus. You know, we don't like to play the odds, but we all end up playing odds in life. And if something causes harm in 10% or 5% of developing babies, that means it doesn't cause harm in 85% or 90 or 95%. Well, if you're one of the people who is really at risk, you may want to consider doing that, even though you don't want something bad to happen. The odds are very much with you. Yeah, and you know, obviously it sounds like something that's not known uh, to cause harm uh, is obviously a good place to start beyond or before something that uh, is known to cause harm. Um, but still, as you're saying this, uh, any of them are, are a better thing to roll the dice on than a guaranteed harm. Uh, such as a piece that I know we both discussed in the New York Times, I believe it was. Uh, the Sunday Times Magazine some time ago had a very a poignant ago. article. Yeah, and I'm reminded of that at this time. Yeah, this young woman didn't want to take SSRIs, was not offered ketamine. She was so conflicted and so concerned uh, about harm to her child that she did nothing until in her six months she stepped off the roof of her parents' building. And um, that had a very adverse consequence. Yeah, I mean, it's giving me chills to hear you say it now, and I, I, I remembered it because I'm the one who, you know, I brought it up, but it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking to think that someone was suffering so much and was so worried about what might happen should they take these medicines that they, they took their life and their child's. And there's no coming back from that. That's a permanent solution, and that's, that's it for both of them, and that's, uh, that's a horrible, worst possible outcome. Don't let that happen to you. Don't let that happen to those you love. There is no, absolutely no redeeming aspects 
to taking one's own life and one's child's life because one is afraid of receiving medication. And for those who are, who are watching who may, who may be pregnant, planning to be, recently been pregnant, or you know, are, are friends or family with, with a woman who is, um, you would mention in the beginning a, a good way of knowing um, whether or not this is uh, something they should consider. You were saying that um, everyone's a little blue, some people are a lot, uh, and I think you had said if, if it persists more than a month, if I remember correctly. Can That's you give, what I said. Can you give any other criteria um, to help someone to assess whether or not they should kind of hang in there or perhaps they want to start seeking counsel or is it really that simple just if this is, you know, interrupting your ability to, to bond with your child and it's persisting more than a month and that, that right there, go and, and, and speak with someone further to assess uh, this? Absolutely. It doesn't mean necessarily that they need some kind of intervention or some kind of pharmacologic prescription. It does mean they need to look closely. If they're not able to be mom and they're not able to be wife and they're miserable and they're suffering, they should look for help. Help from uh, friends one can trust, help from relatives, help from clergy people, help from their physician. These things don't just go away if you ignore them. They typically stay the same or get worse. Often they get worse. There's no